when digital design was all about going bigger and faster. We were all turbo this and overclocking that, and anything we could do to make our design go faster was fair game. Do bipolar transistors run faster? Bring them on. Who cares if we have to throw on a few extra heat sinks, some industrial-grade fans, and maybe a liquid cooling system for good measure? <laughs> Whatever we could do to make our fire-breathing, smoke-belching, building-heating digital designs eke out a few more MIPS or megahertz than the competition was good for us. Yeehaw! Today, however, we have more finesse. Times have changed. All of those who cares about power days are long gone. To get performance today, you need to be efficient, and the most important metric has become performance per watt. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Today, my guests are Maureen Smurden and Ahab Mosin from Xilinx, and we're going to talk about how to maximize performance per watt in your next digital design. Before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find out more information about Xilinx's ultra-scale architecture, including downloading a portfolio backgrounder, several white papers, and viewing a couple videos. Hi, Ahab and Maureen. Thank you so much for joining me today. Sure. Our pleasure. Happy to be here, Amelia. So we hear about performance per watt a lot, particularly in the processor world, like for CPUs and GPUs, for example. Now, you guys are in the programmable solutions industry, so why is performance per watt such a focus from a Xilinx perspective? Well, performance per watt has actually been a big deal for us for a few generations simply because we recognize that architects generally don't have the luxury to freely increase performance without causing runaway power consumption. That can actually lead to unacceptable cooling costs, higher bomb costs, and form factor issues due to things like extra thermal control circuitry, bigger heat sinks, fans, power supplies, and enclosures to hold all of that. Yeah, I think most designers can understand that. So, Ahab, what kind of systems are we really talking about here? Well, we're looking at applications that are at the forefront of their industries. We're watching system designers try to push the technology envelope and push it hard in terms of performance, new functionality, and system intelligence. But like we said, often they're held by power budgets. Communication companies, for example, who are moving beyond 400G to terabit networking need to deal not just with capital outlays, but also the operational expense of extra cooling costs. It's the same thing with data center that's encompassing new acceleration technologies. But it's not just super fast networking systems and big data centers. In the wireless infrastructure space, 4G is here now and 5G is on its way. Architects need to meet new workload requirements for things like baseband and packet processing but they continue to face the physical limitations of existing topologies. For example, they have to wrestle with challenges like tight form factors cast in steel and limited power and cooling resources. It's similar with 4K and 8K broadcast cameras pushing for highest resolution where cameras can't get any bigger and can't have bigger batteries. And now, much more intelligent industrial equipment is everywhere. Most of these are connected across a network and integrate intelligent control, diagnostics, and analytics all while having to minimize electrical costs on the factory floor. Okay, so big things are happening, I get it. But where do programmable devices fit in in all of this? Well, most systems have at least one, if not multiple, high-value silicon devices on board. These could be FPGAs, but also SOCs, ASSPs, ASICs, or some combination of these. Overall system performance is largely driven by the ability for these devices to move massive amounts of data on and off chip, manage and manipulate data effectively, and interface externally in the most power efficient way possible. So today, we'd like to focus on how programmability can address these issues because the flexibility of these devices is really critical to a lot of these trends. And we're not just talking about device level performance per watt, 
but overall system level performance per watt because that's what designers really care about. Given the ability for today's programmable devices to integrate multi-chip functionality, they're really good at improving system level performance per watt. Okay, I think I get where you're going, but we keep saying performance. Now, honestly, in the electronics world, that's kind of a vague and nebulous term. Ahab, what exactly do you mean by performance? Yeah, that's a fair point. So let's get into that. In a programmable device, there are different kinds of performance metrics that end up being the key carebouts. And a system architect will usually consider one or more of these as the most critical. Typically, the first thing that comes to mind is offloading processors using the programmable fabric itself. So you may have opted for an FPGA, but how fast can those customized engines really run? Just how much will they offload the processor, and how much energy will they really save? Then there's the ability to move critical data on and off chip, which is largely the job of serial I.O. in modern systems. Supporting high-speed line rates is definitely important, but so is the signal integrity at those line rates over voltage and temperature variations. And you have to ask how much power is consumed per bit sent or received. But more data throughput means the need for more data storage, and hence more memory buffering. Programmable devices have come a long way in their embedded memory capacity, but often you still have to go off chip and interface to the latest and fastest external memories. Thankfully, bandwidth per pin keeps growing with each generation, but power per pin needs to be kept in check. And then there's signal processing, which is a whole other category of performance, whose metrics are quite diverse depending on the application. And they range from fixed point to floating point computation. And these requirements are often measured in gigamax for things like wireless and gigaflops for applications like data centers, right? Yeah, th those are two big ones. There are plenty of DSP blocks and FPGAs, but their computational efficiency is critical for meeting performance per watt targets. And lastly, now that we're in the age of programmable SOCs, where full-fledged processors are integrated with the fabric, we have to measure these processors by how efficiently they can churn instructions in terms of clock cycles, latency, and of course power. Okay, I think most engineers can relate to these. So, Maureen, what have you guys been doing in moving that performance per watt needle? Great question. At 20 nanometer, we recognized a new approach was needed to handle things like terabit throughput and teraflop processing performance. With the original ultrascale architecture, we fundamentally improved bottlenecks in clocking, critical paths, and the interconnect to address massive data flow in things like real-time packet processing and image processing, all with power budgets in mind. In the latest Ultrascale Plus generation at 16 nanometer FinFET, we're building on this for an even greater performance with greater power efficiency. So we'll walk through some of the key performance per watt carabouts we just outlined that pertain to the FPGA realm, and then we'll just touch on the diverse processing requirements addressed by the Zinc Ultrascale Multiprocessing SOC, or MPSOC. That sounds great. So let's start with FPGAs, since that sounds like the foundation for all of the all programmability you just mentioned. Well, an FPGA's foundation is its programmable logic fabric. A system designer is going to opt for an FPGA for its flexibility with a critical eye on performance and power. But given where design complexity is headed, with Ultrascale, we made the decision to re-architect the programmable infrastructure to keep up. For example, we doubled routing resources and incorporated more agile switching to minimize routing delay. We revamped the whole clocking architecture to be more ASIC-like and regional for minimal skew, and enhanced the logic fabric itself with more connectivity to improve the use of every logic resource. Collectively, this gives us the highest levels of utilization that the industry has ever seen, leading to minimal area for power efficiency and shorter interconnects for greater performance. And that means higher performance per watt, right? Exactly. This also means that designers can either leverage a smaller device or integrate more functionality, all while maintaining high performance. I get how this can impact fabric performance and power. Now, I understand that the latest portfolio uses FinFET. That's got to help too, right? Okay, let's talk about our most advanced FPGAs and FinFETs. There's no denying the leap in performance and lower power with FinFETs, which takes us beyond a normal process node migration. When you move to FinFET, you get faster transistors, lower leakage, and less power consumption. 
Right. This has got to be why everyone is so excited about it. It seems like a clever way to bypass many of the challenges that Moore's Law is facing today. It is. And the industry as a whole is going to benefit from FinFET technology. But we always say it's not just process, but also the architecture. And one of the most interesting things we've done with FinFET technology is strategic voltage tuning, which is really at the heart of our performance per watt strategy. Take a look at the bottom table here where we've normalized the metrics against our 28 nanometer 7 series products. When you move into 20 nanometer ultra scale devices, process and architecture together typically give you a one to two speed grade performance improvement, which is on the order of 15 to 30 percent. And we've averaged that here to 1.2x. With that, you also get reduced power, typically on the order of 30 percent. Overall, that translates into a 1.7x performance per watt improvement. Now running ultra scale plus devices at what's called nominal voltage, or VNOM, you get the highest possible performance available, which is roughly a 60% increase relative to 7 series, plus you get a 20% power reduction. Together, that's 2x performance per watt improvement. That's huge, and it's an industry best in class when considering the FinFET nodes. But there's also something we've done that's very unique. With the same piece of silicon, you can operate at either what's called the nominal voltage or at what we call V-low, which is the lowest possible core voltage. This lets you reduce power while still getting optimal FPGA performance. Here, it's a 2.4x improvement over 7 series. Now, I'm not showing it here, but we carefully made sure that critical transceiver line rates and memory interface speeds are maintained at this lower voltage. Okay, good. Maureen, let's talk about transceivers. Since, like you said, serial I.O. is so central to so many high bandwidth applications. Sure. First, we have to recognize that systems need to keep up with next generation protocols, including JSD 204C used for analog interfacing, PCI Express Gen 4, and emerging technologies like 15 gig HMC serial memory. Support for these need to be not only in the high end FPGAs, but also mid range devices. So, looking at a wireless infrastructure example, an industry that is now in 4G and looking at 5G, system designers are eagerly adopting mid-range programmable solutions in areas like baseband processing and remote radio units, and a diversity of line rates and protocols really adds up, ranging from 16 gig SIPRI to 25 gig Ethernet. But for transceivers, the other side of the performance coin is signal integrity. There are lossy channels everywhere at these high data rates. For example, we see this challenge in N by 100G backplane applications, where there's often serious signal degradation. Out of the box signal quality, as well as automated signal compensation techniques are critical to making these high performance use models a reality. That's where our transceiver designs really shine. They're already proven to be backplane capable at 16 gig and 28 gig at 20 nanometer. Okay, so let's bring this back to performance per watt. One has to worry that power per bit would skyrocket at these line rates. You're right, it's a big concern. In some cases, serial I.O. can consume as much as half of the overall device power. But with ultrascale devices, we're looking at roughly 30% less power versus 7 series at multiple key line rates. Well, that's very encouraging, but general purpose I.O. also consumes power, don't they? Particularly in memory interfacing? Yes, absolutely. So when it comes to memory buffering, naturally designers try and stay on chip if at all possible. If they can't, they're forced to go off chip which is slower and consumes more power. It's as simple as that. So when you think of memory storage available to system designers using FPGAs, you can really think of the solution space as a hierarchy. We've had distributed on-chip RAM for many generations. This RAM is useful for state machines and shift registers. From there, you jump in capacity to block RAM, which again, we've had for many generations. Adding BlockRAM was a key milestone in the FPGA's evolution. BlockRAM is great for shallow buffering and FIFOs. Though we've continued to innovate with BlockRAM, even the largest FPGAs had at most 100 megabits of embedded memory, 
which left a significant gap. So what we've done is introduce an embedded memory technology called UltraRAM that bridges the memory gap and gives designers over 400 megabits of on-chip RAM. This helps keep your data on chip, moving as quickly as possible while consuming the least amount of power. So it looks like Ultra RAM is replacing Block RAM as the new go-to embedded memory technology? Well, not exactly. Ultra RAM is a great technology for deep memory buffering with extensive cascading and extra power efficiency. But block RAM is still better suited for other use cases like FIFOs, so we continue to include them on chip along with Ultra RAM. Okay, it's great that Ultra RAM capacity is in the hundreds of megabits, but how many designs are going to need even more than that for buffering, aren't they? Absolutely. Ultra RAM doesn't pretend to replace all memories. If a system needs data storage in the gigabit range, they're going to need to attach external SDRAM or perhaps a serial memory component like Micron's HMC. We've been working on this front as well, with support for the latest serial memory devices as well as DDR4 support at 2666 megabits per second. So it sounds like we have several memory solutions at our disposal. We can leverage the right ones for the right use models, is that right? Yeah, exactly. I think that's the key takeaway here. Okay, nice. So, switching to processing and computation. Digital signal processing is a huge deal for many applications, from wireless to data centers. So, Ahab, where are we on the DSP front? Well, it's come a long way as well. Applications across the board are demanding signal processing, but the types of computations can differ, ranging from single precision to double precision floating point to fixed point, each of which uses DSP blocks differently. So just to break down a few, in the case of high-speed computing, ultrascale plus DSP blocks have wider multipliers that boost double precision floating point efficiency by a third over seven series. Then for video encoding, there's dedicated logic for motion estimation that cuts DSP block usage in half. And for applications like wireless, new connectivity and logic in each DSP also cuts block usage in half for complex multiply accumulate calculations. And I guess what you're getting at here is that all of these efficiencies lead to less delay across DSP blocks and less power consumed overall? Exactly. Speaking of fewer consumed resources, We've hardwired circuitry in the DSP block to implement high-speed error correction for wired communication systems, which otherwise wouldn't be using the DSP blocks very heavily. Doing this conserves programmable logic to be used for other things. And DSP density is just at another level with Ultrascale Plus. With triple the resources of the 7 Series families, you can see things like 5x greater single precision gigaflop performance for compute-intensive applications like Data Center. Okay, we've talked about fabric, serial I.O., memory, and DSPs. Now you've brought up processor performance per watt earlier. Uh, Let's elaborate more on that. Okay, here we're talking about programmable SOCs. So while a processor was integrated in our Zinc 7000 family, we've really taken this concept to a new level with Ultrascale Plus, where we've introduced an all-programmable multiprocessing SOC with many heterogeneous processing engines integrated on one device, along with the programmable logic fabric featuring all the capabilities we just discussed. Okay, I see a lot going on here. You're showing, from what I assume, are multiple processing engines, like video, graphics, and packet processing? Yeah, that's it. True system intelligence demands diverse kinds of engines. The Zinc MPSOC includes a real-time processing core, a graphics processing core, a video encoding engine, and of course programmable logic for customized engines. Which does make sense since heterogeneous processing does seem to be the way things are heading. Undeniably. And in our case, we're talking about industry standard cores like the ARM Cortex A53 quad core, an ARM Cortex R5 dual core real-time processor, and an ARM Mali graphics processor, as well as other engines. All right, Ahab, these sound like brand names. Yeah, brand names with industry-tested tools and vast ecosystems, which an embedded designer is going to be concerned about. 
And each of these elements can be assigned the workload best suited for its architecture. And that's what we mean by the right engines for the right tasks. Okay, I get it. Workload distribution is a well understood concept, but the integration you have here and the tie in with programmable logic is something I don't think we've seen before. Yeah, we see this as an industry first. In fact, it's the massive integration of versatile cores and customizable logic that's taking us to the next level of performance per watt. Okay, so you say next level, but I'm not sure what that means. Maureen, what kind of numbers are we really talking about here? Generally, we see up to a 5x performance per watt improvement over our 28 nanometer Zinc 7000. In fact, we did a thorough analysis for a wide array of applications for both FPGAs and MPSOCs and saw a range of 2 to 5x improvement. Wow, okay, 5x is pretty huge. And these don't seem to be small time applications. I see terabit networking, 5G wireless, industrial internet of things. Seems like your application space here is pretty broad. Between the FPGA families and MPSOCs, yeah, it really is. And like we said, to be the center of these systems, we've recognized that cranking up the performance is almost meaningless without considering power budgets, and it's performance per watt targets that really matter. That's why the Ultrascale Plus FPGAs have been tuned in so many different dimensions, like the ones we've walked through today, to scale for performance and power. And the MPSOCs enables major leap in system performance per watt due to massive integration while bringing next generation system intelligence to the table. Well, thanks you two. Where should I go if I want even more information? Yeah, xilinx.com slash ultrascale is a great place to start where you'll find links to more detail and a lot of the performance per watt analysis by application for both FPGAs and MPSOCs. Well, that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me, Ahab and Maureen. Our pleasure. Thank you. Before we go, don't forget to click that link. There you can find more information about this subject. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to YouTube, keyword EE Journal, or head to the on-demand section of eejournal.com. <laughs>